Every year, Hamilton Native Outpost has a field day to share knowledge of native plants. Elizabeth Steele discussed how a diversity of plants, including warm and cool season plants, as well as different height and plant structures benefit a grassland. This field day focused on grazing diverse native grasslands with livestock, but the information presented here can be useful to anyone interested in native plants. Elizabeth has been studying plants in nature since she was a toddler, being taught about the natural world by her parents. In the description, check out other videos from the field day. Now we join the field day as Elizabeth is introducing her topic. So at this station, we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, so the whole theme of the day is how plants are stronger together than alone. In other words, if you have a diversity of plants like we have out here, this is a three-year-old uh, diverse native grassland planting that we've done. So this is its third growing season. And that's a lot more stable than if we just picked out one of those plants and had the whole field growing in that. So why is that? And why can we get more production, as we're interested in in the forage world, out of something that's diverse like this? But then not only that, we're also serving those ecosystem services to, you know, filter the water and do all of that stuff as well. So part of where my mind goes with all of this is just the basics of the warm season and the cool season, right? You've got, no matter what the weather is, you've got a plant that likes it. So if the weather is nice and cool, back in April, the cool season plants really thrive and flourish. If you've got the warm season plants, uh, you know, up here in about a month, the cool season plants don't find it all that enjoyable to grow up in July, but they really like earlier. So you've just got always that plant that's adapted to the climate that you have in that season of the year. And so the way that they do that, the way that, you know, the actual difference between a cool season and a warm season plant is a physiological, so inside the plant difference of how they actually photosynthesize, how they actually take that carbon from the air, take the sunlight and convert it into plant food. And so in the C3 or cool season, and just in case I, I, in my mind, these are, I go back and forth between these two terms, the C3 and cool season, but in case your mind doesn't go back and forth like that, I wrote you a, cheat, a little cheat sheet up here. So in that cool season, photosynthetic pathway, in other words, the way it takes sunlight and makes food out of that, it's kind of the basic photosynthetic pathway, if you want to go there with me. And there's a couple problems with it. One, it can take in oxygen. So plants are supposed to take in carbon dioxide, right? That's what they make their food from. But it can take in oxygen as well. And at higher temperatures, it does this worse. It gets to working so fast that it can't distinguish the oxygen and the carbon dioxide from each other. And there's a lot more oxygen in the air than there is carbon dioxide. So if you think about it, they're not efficient at those high temperatures. Well, that makes sense. We don't see cool seasons growing very much at high temperatures. So there's another problem. When the plant has to open that stomata or that hole in the leaf so that the carbon dioxide can go into the plant, because that's how carbon dioxide enters the plant is through this little hole in the leaf, then oxygen or water, I'm sorry, can escape. So again, in the summer, we've got usually a low moisture situation. It tends to be spring, we've got good moisture. Well, it doesn't matter if the stomata are open and we're losing some more water, we just pick it up from the soil, no big deal. But in the middle of summer, it becomes a bigger deal. And so those are the two features that make a cool season plant not very adapted to the warm seasons. And if you look, I looked at a graph here the other day, and basically, somewhere up around the Canada-US line, you get more efficient, more growth out of cool seasons than you do warm seasons. So that's to say that down here in Missouri, warm seasons will give you more growth, and they do, um, than the cool season plants will. So if we look at the warm seasons and say, well, what if we have the warm seasons? What are their pros and cons, and how do they fit into this picture? The Warm season plants basically have an add-on process to the photosynthetic pathway that the cool season plants have. So what this process does is it 
isolates, they can't take in the oxygen. They can't make the mistake of taking in an oxygen in that process. They can only take in carbon dioxide. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it's very efficient at collecting this carbon dioxide, but it comes at an expense. It requires extra energy. We need more sunlight for that plant to do its job of photosynthesis. Well, this is a perfect match for summer. It has full sunlight. It has high temperatures. So the oxygen and carbon dioxide confusion isn't happening. And we've, it's more efficient with the water because the stomata don't have to stay open as long. Those holes in the leaves don't have to stay open as long for that carbon dioxide to get into that leaf. And so what we've got is a plant that's designed very well to deal with cool season temperatures. And I would go so far as to say the cool seasons do well in cool temperatures or maybe even warm temperatures when you don't have direct light. So there's cool season plants that grow in a tropical rainforest. But a lot of times they like to be down under the canopy of the trees. So we can have cool temperatures or even warming temperatures, but that lower light, and then they like to have that good moisture. The warm seasons, the hotter the better. They love high light. In fact, they don't really like to grow too much into the shade a lot of times. And they're very efficient with moisture. And so if we look at the season, the year through the seasons, in the spring, it's a perfect match for the cool seasons. And that makes sense. That's when our fescue grows. We all know the growth curve of the fescue grows in the spring, grows again in the fall. That makes sense. Native cool season plants do the exact same thing. Now one might begin a little earlier, earlier than fescue even. One might begin a little later than fescue. So you've got all of this different times that they're beginning, but they all love that cool season of the year. That's when their photosynthetic pathway really allows them to shine. When it's a dry spring though, you often get a real cut in your cool season forage production, right? Because those plants don't deal well with that drought. They need their stomata open to take in the carbon dioxide, but at the same time, they're losing water. And so the warm seasons, they can thrive on that lack of moisture, which is more typically what we see in the summer. So if we move into the summer and maybe we define summer as when we get above 86 degrees, I don't know. That's the point at which the warm season is more photosynthetically um, efficient than the cool season. So remember that warm season required that extra energy, the extra sunlight, the extra temperature for it to function. And so we get to 86 and the warm seasons really begin to shine. Below that, the cool seasons tend to shine. So in the summer, we've got of course, those warm season grasses, they can come on and they, they grow a lot of forage really quick. But the problem is they only grow for five or six months of the year. So then if we have mixed the warm and the cool seasons together, basically we've been able to have forage production in each of those seasons. So that's one of the things that comes to my mind when I think about how does a diverse native grassland how are those plants stronger together than if we just had big blue stem or we just had one of the native cool seasons like Virginia wild rye. Another thing that comes to my mind is the fact that these plants layer themselves. And okay, so part of this discussion still hinges on this knowledge that the cool temperatures for a cool season grass or maybe even warm temperatures with low light and all and good moisture is what this plant needs. And a warm season plant, you need your hot temperatures and it doesn't, I mean, sure, water's good. It needs some, but it's more efficient with that water. So in the summer is when this layering thing I really see starting to shine. So you've got your, the warm seasons are red and the cool seasons are blue. That's my color coding for you guys. <laughs> so you have here your warm season grasses and they're big and tall. They get growthy. Big blue stem, some people have described it, some of the settlers, as tall as a man on horseback. 
So it's really tall, tall grass, and you've got your war your cool season grasses. I mean, a tall cool season grass is probably waist high, and so a lot of them are more like knee high. So in the summertime, what you've got is you've got this big blue stem or this Indian grass, these tall grasses that are above your cool season grasses. Well, we can't change the temperature of the day, but what we've done is we've changed the light situation. We've got a low light situation now because you've got the shade of that big blue stem or that Indian grass plant next to you. So it can actually still be photosynthesizing and be more efficient than as if it were in the, in the full sun. The other part of that that I think is super interesting is so you've got your soil life down here in the soil maybe we'll say down here and it is consuming the organic matter consuming the last year's dead plant material doing its thing down here and it produces carbon dioxide just like we do it consumes food breathes out carbon dioxide so you've got this carbon dioxide that's a lot higher at the ground level because you've got that soil life functioning down there. In fact, some of the numbers that I was seeing was that maybe it's two to six times higher down at the ground level than it is, you know, up here in the air that I'm breathing right now. So we've got this situation where these cool season grasses, you remember, they don't do very good with the oxygen in the system. So now we've created a higher carbon dioxide, lower oxygen system down here for this little blue plant the cool season plant to function. And so we've made it, you know, in two ways, we've made it a lot more efficient with its photosynthesis through that summer period. The other thing that's really important though is that if you get a wind, a breeze, that carbon dioxide at the ground will just blow away or disperse up into the air, mix into the rest of the air. So then you lose that really high concentration down here at the ground. So having tall plants out there, having things like big blue stems, or this is a sawtooth sunflower. Um, now it is a cool season plant, so it's not like, you know, this is a hard and fast rule, but most of the forbs, as a side note, most, almost all of the forbs are cool season plants, photosynthetically. Some of them may grow in the warm season, but their, their insides work like a cool season plant. And so plants like this or plants like the big blue stems and Indian grasses, they help to slow that wind at the ground level so that we can maintain that high carbon dioxide layer down here, which I mean also benefits the warm season grasses, but it super benefits those cool season plants. There's another type of layering that I see happen happening too, and we'll jump off of the whole photosynthetic photosynthesis track here and talk about like just shape of plants and so some plants are very upright you know they have leaves that just come out of the ground and go upright like this think of grasses um, so you know if you've got a grass that's going like this that is one shape of leaf but if you would add some horizontal leaves in between those so if we've got a grass leaf here and we've got a forb leaf here, well, there's a lot of forb leaves that can fit between those grass leaves. And remember that a lot of those forb leaves that are running horizontal, those are C3 or cool season plants, so they need the shade, they appreciate the shade from the other plants. Now again, not every one of those plants follows this rule of thumb, right? The sunflowers are super tall and they get taller than maybe anything else out there. But at the same time, a lot of them do. The little Samson snake root, little legume that crawls across the ground. It's a little viney thing. I imagine it really appreciates the high carbon dioxide, the shading from those grass leaves. So the other, the other shapes of leaves that are around it. So that's another take on the layering that I think happens and I think makes stronger the diversity out here than just having a field of the same thing. In the video description, there are links to other talks from this field day. Justin Thomas shares his thoughts about how nature works. Lauren Steele discusses why a diversity of plants is good for livestock. 
Amy Hamilton looks below ground and speaks about how a diversity of root systems makes for a grassland that is stronger than a monoculture, and Colt Hamilton speaks about establishing a diverse native silvopasture or savanna.